Uh, good morning, everyone. Good to have a good turnout. Uh, um, I'm very excited to hear how uh, what Carletta thinks now. Heard her a few months ago. Uh, she's incredibly able and talented, and and um, is really on the ground. And so she's um, and talked to us about food, energy, water, um, uh, security, and sovereignty during COVID-19. Uh, it's a tremendously important topic, and uh, I'm very grateful that she could take time out of an extraordinarily hectic schedule to join us. So, uh, Carletta, welcome to the College of Law and the Environmental Breakfast Club, albeit virtually. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's really neat to be here to join you, especially I really enjoy uh, going across um, our virtual campus now, but, um, you know, literally during when we are on campus, it's often difficult to get across um, across campus. So great to see you all and wonderful uh, to join you here today and uh, just just excited for this conversation. I wanna talk about a training program we have on campus uh, called Indigenous Food Security and Sovereignty and how that has really uh, ramped up during COVID-19 and really brought together uh, synergies um, on and off campus. So COVID-19 has had a, a big impact on indigenous people and the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People called for input on COVID-19 impacts on Indigenous people. I was really delighted to see that the Howery uh, program invited the Rapporteur to campus recently, uh, led by uh, Tony Massaro. On, and so um, it was uh, really interesting to understand those impacts, um, they're very different from, you know, the everyday citizen, mainly because many of these communities are very culturally uh, based and also are in remote and also in uh, urban centers. Locally, we've heard a lot of news about the impact of COVID-19 on the Navajo Nation. Uh, the rates of COVID-19 infections on the Navajo Nation skyrocketed uh, in around April 2020, causing the rates to be uh, at uh, rates behind New York and New Jersey. And I think at one point it actually even uh, um, was higher than those rates. So the Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez really took it um, the bull by the horns and began to do some national advocacy about the impacts and um, really was uh, talking about how the Navajo Nation had lack of access to food, to energy and water, and also highlighted how the uh, CARES funds weren't getting them to them quickly but they were also very strict on the health policies in comparison to most uh, states across the United States. The Navajo Nation implemented uh, stay at home uh, right. lockdowns or um, curfews. Um, they had uh, week down uh, um, lockdowns where nobody could leave leave their home or travel and so they made special times for people to get food particularly for elders but they just really um, ensured that people stay at home they also closed down the borders not letting anybody come in they also um, implemented strict policies for social distancing wearing masks they also didn't allow tourists to come in and uh, close down the casinos. And there are many national parks across the Navajo Nation. And these are, you know, national attractions, uh, beautiful places to visit and um, also stimulates the economy of the Navajo Nation. All that was locked, locked down and closed. And this was a big um, 
uh, decision for the Navajo Nation because it also meant that they were going to incur a huge financial loss. So on the Navajo Nation, um, there is a complex wicked problem in terms of not only the, um, you know, the history and the historical trauma um, leading to other environmental impacts related to uh, uh, mining and how that's impacted people's health, especially with uranium mining. Um, also, in addition to that, there's core morbidities that are um, at higher rates in comparison to other um, racial groups. And um, all that also increases the, the risk to severe conditions of COVID-19. So with all of this happening, um, the food, energy, water insecurities were amplified during COVID-19. The Navajo president held um, food drives where people don't have to drive as far to get food, but typically, you know, people have to drive far to go grocery shopping because there's only 13 grocery stores across the Navajo Nation. And um, that's, uh, you know, smaller grocery stores. So sometimes people will often go to border towns like Gallup or Farmington or Page or Flagstaff to uh, get other supplies. But this is a typical um, scene, you know, where uh, individuals will have to go um, travel to haul water in, in the back of their trucks. And this is actually a photo I took in my own community. My parents rely on this source. Um, so um, my, my father, he'll, you know, like many people load up his water tank here. And this is um, pretty, pretty grueling. You know, my, my father's uh, 75 years old and these uh, tanks are pretty, pretty heavy to, to carry. Um, so uh, it ends up costing the Navajo citizen much more than somebody who lives in a city who could just turn on their tap. And for, for energy, um, they, many people either use indoor, um, they'll, they'll burn coal or wood, use kerosene lamps or um, use generators if they have more resources. But I'm from the Navajo Nation, and so I grew up with this um, around me. You know, I didn't have electricity or running water. Um, first time I had that luxury was actually when I arrived on the Stanford campus. Um, and if you've ever been to Stanford, it's, you know, kind of a utopia, um, living in a really nice house and having a chef. <laughs> um, cook your meals, and suddenly I'm co coming from a really... Um, remote area to something like Stanford to, to, to luxury. So, but many uh, Navajo families are, are um, in this situation, especially with the COVID-19 uh, curfews and lockdowns, getting access to food and water was even more uh, challenging. So the University of Arizona and my programs have had a long-term community engagement with tribal nations um, around these issues, particularly with mining. And I am an extension specialist, so I work within cooperative extension. And much of my work has um, been embedded in these uh, land-grant university programs. And then more recently, we had a uh, project with the Navajo Nation on Golki Mine Spill that was um, to look at how the Navajo people were impacted by the spill. So a lot of this builds upon each other. Um, uh, with the Superfund program, we go out to tribal colleges and university. Our, my students yeah. develop learning modules to um, look at what uh, mining impacts are and how the students can pursue higher education. We also often bring uh, indigenous uh, partners to campus. Like for example, a couple of years ago, we had this forum on campus. We had Perry Charlie come and talk about traditional knowledge. Um, 
So, uh, so this is all going programs that we have. But what we aim to do in cooperative extension and at the University of Arizona is to make sure that any kind of engagement that we have with um, tribal communities um, abides by tribal consultation goals set by the Arizona Board of Regents. And that means um, really developing trust and communicating with tribal partners, being um, transparent and involving them in every step of the way, and also getting the tribal approvals necessary. I'm really proud of the University of Arizona because we actually have individuals on campus to help us with um, implementing these tribal consultation goals, including um, uh, Levi Escuera, who's the new SVP for Native American Advancement, and then Claudia Nelson, who leads the Native American People Technical Assistance Office. So they work together to ensure that um, faculty and staff abide by these uh, tribal consultation goals. So the University of Arizona actually has uh, um, tribal uh, extension agents based on uh, tribal lands. And so these are the nations on which we have full-time uh, staff located in these communities. And um, they help to bridge that with the extension of faculty. And um, the website here is shown and the lead of that uh, tribal extension is Trent Tigerstrom. And so I encourage you that whenever you go uh, on to a tribal land, look up um, the tribal extension agents and just um, uh, contact them and see, um, you know, uh, what they're up to and make sure you get permission and, and just let them know you're there. So I just wanted to give an example of um, the Gold Key Mines Bill and how we worked with the communities to really get their input with the, um, uh, the research that we eventually did. So it's really important to involve the community and understand their concerns. So from the Gold Key Mines Bill, we took another uh, step to um, think about how can we train our students to work with indigenous communities? With the Gold Key Mines Bill, we had 100 students involved over the five years and more than half of them were Native American. So for the other half, um, we had to train them. We had to talk about cultural protocols, talk about um, what it means to go into a community and then also um, to, uh, to, I'm sorry, there's a lot of background noise and I can't concentrate. Um, do you mind muting yourself? Not sure who it could be. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we knew that students at the University of Arizona were interested in working with tribal nations. Um, but uh, they may not know how to work with tribal nations. And so um, no, um, we knew there, we, we knew there was a need um, to have this type of training. And so we talked with um, who we really worked with uh, in the Gold Cane Mines Bill to develop a proposal for a training program on campus. And the University of Arizona is really um, uh, situated to be the leader in this because we're a land grant university, we have tribal extension, we have um, one of the largest number of native faculty on campus, there are over 30. And um, Ron Trospers, who is here with us today is actually the president of the Native Faculty Association. And many of our native faculty have these keystone programs across campus. Mm -hmm. So U of A is really situated to be um, the expert in training students. So um, our goal was to 
train uh, our students to have intercultural awareness, to develop expertise in the food, energy, water system, to work with um, off-grid technologies and co-design and co-solve technologies to address these challenges. So currently um, we have 26 trainees, a third of them are Native American. Uh, sometimes people think that our training programs just for indigenous people, but actually um, it's through the funding from the National Science Foundation, we um, are able to um, fund US citizens. So the center of our um, training is these off-grid systems to develop off-grid systems that are going to reach the um, person who lives off a of central infrastructure, who doesn't have access to food, energy, or water. So with the local water source, they can treat the water using solar panels, and then the um, effluent can be used for agricultural purposes using a greenhouse, which would be also powered by solar. So our students um, have uh, several training components that they um, uh, will engage in during their time. So that includes um, training on how to teach at tribal colleges and universities, being immersed in the community, um, focusing on a pilot project and learning about those offered technologies, uh, pursuing a PhD minor in food energy water systems, uh, we have professional development for them and they do internships um, and their uh, research is centered around the FUSE nexus, nexus. So our trainees actually really enjoy going to the NET College and uh, working with tribal college students. And uh, many of them um, lead these um, training exercises um, that includes um, lectures and hands-on activities. And the students, the tribal college students at the end of the week uh, share what they learn with the community. This is the system that is now at Danet College. And so Danet College land grant office now uses the system as part of their outreach and engagement within the community. And um, so the students at Danette College uh, continue to learn about the system. And so it also stimulates and encourages them in their own pathway to obtaining a, a degree. So in terms of cultural immersion, we bring our students, our trainees to the Navajo Nation for spring break and for other field work. And during that time, we always have opportunity for them to uh, learn from a cultural expert. So these are engineering, um, these are actually all engineering students here uh, sitting in a hogan. So they spent the night uh, sleeping on a sheepskin on a uh, on Mother Earth. Um, and each night they would learn about the Navajo worldview about food, energy, water. Meanwhile, you know, they um, use an outhouse, they have to go um, haul their water and um, make sure, you know, they have enough food. So, so um, uh, many of the trainees uh, really got to understand what it is like to be off grid and then understand culturally of what it means um, for, for the Diné people. So in all of the work that we do and the training that we do, we really center decolonization. And that doesn't mean um, that we're gonna reject, reject Western science or Western knowledge, um, but really that we're gonna center indigenous concerns and their worldviews to understand um, their perspectives um, and do uh, the work with their purpose in mind. So this comes from Linda Smith, decolonizing methodology, um, who really goes into detail about uh, decolonizing research. And the main reason she did that was because, uh, you know, oftentimes research is a bad word in indigenous communities because of a lot of the bad practices that have happened. 
And indigenization is what we aim to do in our training. That means um, including indigenous perspectives, their values and understanding in the research and education and outreach that we do and positioning their way of knowing. And that's what we mean by co-design and co-solve. So we're not going in there dropping off these um, technologies, but really working with the communities to, to, to see if it works best or what they think about it. And then abiding by the cultural protocols and practices um, of the community. Here's an example of how we do that. So our students actually did this themselves. I did not um, lead them in doing this. They were asked to work in an interdisciplinary team. So they had um, teams of uh, trainees that were in American Indian Studies and chemical engineering and environmental science. They were very interdisciplinary. And so what they proposed was a solar Hogan greenhouse where um, the outreach could occur with K through 12 students in a setting that was um, emulating the Dene worldview of um, life, seasons, and teaching. And so the solar greenhouse would be set up like that. And so we're currently um, interested in actually finding ways to implement this with our partners. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, we were able to contribute right away. So uh, Dr. Marat Casera, who leads the Control Environmental Agricultural Center, his trainees and students donated uh, their produce to the Navajo Nation. So they worked with Karen Francis Begay to make that donation. And then uh, we received an uh, invitation by the Tribal Council for me to talk about um, the uh, off-grid uh, water treatment system that we had developed because they had heard about our work with the NET College. So um, I presented there and through many conversations and dialogues, we were eventually invited to join the Navajo Nation Water Access Coordination Group, which consists of many federal, state, nonprofit, university entities working to identify ways that they can increase uh, water access points for the Navajo people during the um, pandemic. And with the help of the HOWRI uh, program in social and environmental justice, we received um, two small grants. And one, the first one is to collaborate with other universities to bring together water quality data sources and to identify um, water, um, water needs and provide that to the Navajo leaders while they're trying to develop these new water access points. And from that, we wanted to use that information to link what does it mean uh, for Navajo people in terms of their risk to COVID-19, especially because um, many of their waters are non-potable um, re resulting in exposure to arsenic and uranium and having the comorbidities like diabetes. What does that all mean when you think about the risk to COVID-19? So um, we had multiple conversations on campus and I, uh, Robert Glidden was actually part of that. Thank you, Robert. Um, and we put together a white paper, sent, send it back to the Navajo Nation and pretty much let them know what we could do. And from all of those conversations that came to um, uh, letting the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board know that we wanted to submit an application for human research back in July um, about assessing these COVID risks and increasing indigenous resilience. Um, notice how I put August 2020 submission. Actually, I really over underestimated, actually underestimated that date. I just submitted that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> so it's taken like uh, seven or eight months to get all the approval process for this application. So the Navajo Nation always asks, how is it going to benefit the Navajo Nation? 
Um, and we said that, you know, it's uh, going to identify the risks associated with COVID-19, provide better health messaging for COVID-19, train Navajo citizens on off-grid um, technologies, um, involve Navajo students, and then um, uh, aiming that these technologies would uh, work to uh, assist um, Navos to have better access to food, energy, water, and hence uh, increase Navajo resilience. So the goals of um, our letter of intent was an overarching goal, and we have since been able to um, get other funding sources um, digging deeper into these goals but basically to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 on the Navajo Nation, increase the community's resilience to pandemic through these off-grid technologies that would be designed and built and operated by the NEST citizens. So what we wanted to do was identify the risk factors for COVID-19 and then also identify the perceptions to adopting these off-grid technologies. So the first thing we did early on, which happened um, probably by this time, June of 2020, was to um, do this data analysis and create maps. So the next thing we want to do is um, do some questionnaires and focus groups. Um, so once we get approvals by the Navajo Nation, which I will be presenting to them hopefully in a couple of weeks, um, and then hopefully we can start doing these um, come um, April or May. So one of the things that we do have in our group is that we have an Indigenous Advisory Committee who helps um, to give us feedback on the work that we're doing. And these are all individuals either working with the Navajo Nation or in academia that have expertise in working with tribal communities. They all come from different um, uh, fields, but they all have um, the input, the feedback that we need to do our work correctly. So I mentioned how it took a long time to um, get to submit my application to Navajo Airby. Well, the um, process is that you have to get approvals from the chapters. And so we identified three chapters first um, to get approvals, mainly because these were chapters that were working with Dig Deep, which is a um, nonprofit working with uh, Navajo communities to get water. So it was very different um, during the pandemic, mainly because, um, uh, you know, now everybody's uh, working remotely, chapters are closed down. So it took us a while to like find how they were made doing their meetings, either get on a telephone line or a Zoom line to present um, our project and to get the, the chapter resolution. So we're able to get three chapter resolutions. They're shown here from those three. And then from there, from these three communities, we began to work outwards. Um, with the area regional uh, councils. So we've been able to get three approvals from the three um, councils. But it's not, it hasn't been an easy process because most of the time we're able to easily call somebody or attend a meeting, get on the planning meeting, be present in person. Now we had to, you know, basically um, find a needle in a haystack to find where people were get. Um, telephone numbers and a, and a lot of times people are not connected to internet or you know maybe their cell phone um, reception um, may not work all the time. One minute please. Okay that was my son he came by to ask for some food <laughs> so um so what we did was we looked at the risk factors for the data that we had easily available these are all public sources and then working with the Navajo water access coordination group to get more information and so we're looking at you know census data um uh, ihs data 
um, any kind of socioeconomic factors that we could get publicly available to look at their risk factors um, um, so that we can understand the community resilience, their ability to adapt, and then um, connect that to what are the uh, transmission and infection rates of COVID-19. So this is the process. So we're actually um, further along than I say here in terms of um, the, the steps. We've identified the metrics. We visualize the results. Um, we're currently um, building and deploying a data portal that can be available to the leaders for their decision making. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that um, at the end of my presentation. So the data sources um, come from many decades of research that our partners have been engaging in with the Navajo Nation. And that includes um, data that other indiv individuals and entities have acquired over the years, um, including the Navajo Nation's uh, own data and their monitoring effort. Um, and all of that um, was put into this database that we um, have developed in the last uh, several months. And th this is what it, um, the data sources look like. You know, they're from U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Navajo EPA, USGS, even nonprofits, um, the Center for Disease Control, uh, academic institutions, um, all coming together to put in all of this water quality records. So um, this is a, a look at what we tried to do was to look at the first risk, which is arsenic, uh, exposure to arsenic and uranium. And we interpolated um, the data that we got across the Navajo Nation. And you can see for arsenic, um, when you compare it to the maximum contaminant level of 10 parts per billion, which is the red, you can see there's um, a spine coming down through the center of the Navajo Nation and along the western edges of the western um, Navajo Nation. For uranium, we still also see that spine coming down in terms of the red areas that exceed 30 um, parts per billion and then also some in the Western areas. And then again, some along the south, uh, eastern, um, southern portions, uh, southeastern portions of the Navajo Nation. So this helps to just kind of look at like, what are the communities that really are at risk to exposure to uranium arsenic so that um, the efforts can be prioritized to uh, help these communities get better drinking water sources. So currently what we're trying to do is we want to make this available to the Navajo leaders and the Navajo decision makers so that they can make quick decisions, especially like with this type of um, situation where there's an emergency um, to be able to come together as university um, partners to provide that data and make it easily available for them. Um, and, and so this is what it would look like. Somebody could click on a point and be able to know what that well is um, and see what the metals and metalloids are and if they exceed the maximum contaminant level. So this has come up oftentimes even for people, um, water, water haulers, because they might be hauling from a water source and they don't know um, if it's potable or non-potable. Some of them do have signs, but some of them don't. The Navajo Nation has really um, uh, improved their uh, COVID-19 data as time has gone on by having this dashboard um, that's available. So you can go online and see this. And um, in Navajo, they call it the Kosensagi 19. There's a lot of controversy about this uh, word because it basically the Kos means cough and Sagi means big. So basically big cough. Um, and which is also associated with the flu, the same word uh, used for the flu. So a lot of people um, criticize the Navajo Nation for using that because they said it doesn't really reflect this, um, this virus. But anyways, that name stuck, so they have to use it going forward. 
Um, so currently there's um, 29, over 29,000 cases, which is about 70% of the uh, Navajo population. So this is what we use to do our analysis because we actually don't have um, any other data available. So just to do preliminary results. So we basically took um, the numbers from the um, IHS Indian Health Service area service units. So there's eight of them that go across the Navajo Nation. We took basically those eight points to do our preliminary analysis. And uh, for the Winslow area, they tended to have the lower um, numbers of cases. And then the Chinle unit, which is right here, um, had the highest uh, number of COVID infections. So we were able to get um, data from the American Community Sur Survey, which is uh, available online from the census and look at um, these chapters and see which homes um, lacked uh, plumbing. So the darker the blue, the um, more homes that lacked uh, access to plumbing. So the darkest blue is greater than 45%. So um, this helped us to give us a visualization. So um, the population on the Navajo Nation is about 173,000. And majority of the Navajo people are young, um, as you can see the peak here, the histogram here. But many, many of the Navajo people are younger. And, um, but a lot of people also live off the Navajo Nation. So we took that publicly available data and we linked it to sociodemographic factors. And we did a lot of different analysis. So I'm just going to show you um, some key points. And so when you look at um, the number of people that don't speak Navajo or don't speak English and correlate it to the COVID-19 um, infections, um, you could see that there was actually a, a connection. So um, Kienta has um, uh, less people speaking English and they had higher rates of COVID-19 in infection along with Chinle. Um, and so you see that regression line um, going through that shows there may be a connection between um, a, a language and uh, infection. So that just says, you know, it's important to um, consider public health messaging and how that is done. Then I wanted to share the COVID-19 waves and um, what it is right now. So this is uh, the wave since March and um, uh, these uh, graded uh, shaded areas show the lockdowns, like the weekend lockdown when the peak started, the infection rate started going up. And then the Navajo put in a complete lockdown, which um, was really strict, you know, when you compare it to the West, the, the rest of the US. Uh, so the, the wave came back down, and then um, they still maintained a 32 hour lockdown. And people started getting mad because they're like, we're tired of being home. People started um, uh, violating the curfews, even like when the peak was down, the Navajo Nation still, still maintain a lockdown. Um, and then with uh, people started, you know, congregating during the holidays, during Labor Day, and then the spikes went back up again. I mean, the cases started to spike and started to peak. And the Navajo Nation put in a 56 hour lockdown again. Um, and then the vaccination started in December. My, my dad actually got a call in December from his doctor because they had some vaccines available left over from the first, first responders. So they were uh, started vaccinating the elders um, uh, in December. So you could see that impact and then the, the decline now that we're on. So, um, 78% of the Navajo people have been vaccinated, um, but that number is just one that I quickly calculated based on the population that lives on the Navajo Nation, but there's um, actually people that, you know, there's a lot of Navajos that live off the Navajo Nation. 
and I've heard stories of um, <clears throat> Navajos who live in urban areas that can't get vaccines. So they actually drive, you know, maybe they live in San Francisco or something and they're driving, you know, the 15 hours back to the Navajo Nation to get a vaccine. So this percentage is probably not accurate. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the vaccine effort has been um, pretty effective. Um, this is a photo from the Durango Herald, and um, they have a, a long line of people. So they just basically made it open to an age group, and then uh, people just lined up in their cars and uh, got vaccinated. And my parents actually did this too. And my parents don't use the phone. I, you know, I recently taught my mom how to text. And I was like, oh, you should have taken a photo, you know, but that's not really on their minds. But just as an example of, um, you know, just the effort um, and which is really in stark contrast to the West of the rest of the U.S. So the Navajo Times um, in February said that 44 percent of Navajos living on the reservation are vaccinated with at least the first dose. And when you compare it to the state, the closest one is uh Alaska, which is 15.2%. Um, and it's more than the US average at that time, which was close to 13%. More than any country except the United Arab Immigrants, which was at 44.8%. And so the currently vaccinating 16 or 18 years old, old uh, individuals, depending on which vaccine they get, either the Pfizer or the Moderna, so by currently uh, today, 78%, um, uh, that's, um, you know, assuming that those are all the ones that live on the Navajo Nation, but really people are driving back home just to get that a vaccine. So in conclusion, um, this effort is new and the preliminary, uh, uh, preliminary analysis we did is really um, using public data, but it did show us that there is a relationship to um, certain risk factors, particularly with language um, and insurance. Um, but we really need to get uh, more detailed data at the chapter level to really look further at the risk factors. And then when we do, you know, our focus groups and questionnaires um, that will help us even more to understand these risk factors. Um, it is important to have long-term community engagement and abide by tribal consultation to um, have respectful partnerships and engagement with tribes. And I believe that University of Arizona is the best place to train students to have intercultural awareness, um, especially in STEM, you know, um, because uh, that's not typical to have transdisciplinary training to go across into social sciences um, to ensure that they're also being trained to um, engage respectfully and also to design solutions um, uh, that is appropriate for indigenous communities. And they will be the leaders um, leading the edge in the world because it's not just a challenge for communities indigenous communities, but for many developing communities um, in the world. So I'm actually one of many, many, many people um, as part of this effort. And I wanna acknowledge everybody and the students uh, involved, um, not only in Indigifuse, but also um, the, the new grants that we've received that expanded our collaborations. And I'm thankful to the funding that we've had um, the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Environmental Health, Superfund, the um, Howry Program in Environment and Social Justice, and uh, Arizona Institute for Resilience. I also want to invite you to our Native Voices in STEM, our next um, seminars, uh, March 17th by Daniel Wildcat. Uh, gracias, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you. Take any questions. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's impressive what's happening. With the percentage of people who've been, my, can you hear me? Yeah. 
the percentage of people on the reservation who've been inoculated is 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 dramatic and uh so it's great to see that uh, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, the programs you're describing are just, just really quite wonderful, Carletta. So I'm not gonna take the time. I know a number of other people are interested in asking you questions. So uh, please unmute, un, 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 unmute yourself, unmute yourself and um, ask what you would like of Carletta. You're getting your, your legal terms mixed up. I always use that word to mute, moot. <laughs> So, <laughs> Bruce? Uh, good morning, and thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I've been involved in doing work around solar energy in uh, different uh, areas, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about two aspects of that um, in Navajo country. Number one is the possibility of developing uh, expertise um, among the students at Dina University or elsewhere in solar technology to replace the, the Navajo uh, power plant, which, as you know, has been recently decommissioned. And the second one is whether any of the either the greenhouses or the water purification systems are equipped that they might also serve as cell phone chargers when people are doing uh, planting work or water purification work. So they would serve uh, more than one purpose at the same time. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so our training um, in the past three years has primarily focused on Deneb College and the tribal college uh, students. And the way that we're doing it is, uh, you might know Kelly Simmons Potter in electrical engineering, um, who does a lot of this type of uh, work in solar energy and training. And so what we developed was learning modules, um, which has a, um, the hands-on instruction, uh, PowerPoint, um, and uh, an instructional guide. And so um, the idea was that we would provide a really comprehensive learning module such that, you know, we would pilot um, one day of it at Dine College and then um, continue that throughout, you know, each academic year. The tribal college students come down to the University of Arizona and do a summer internship. And then during the year that this would be available to tribal college faculty um, and within their existing courses um, to you know, take parts as they need for their courses. And then engaging with the college to talk about ways that they can boost their curriculum in these areas. Um, so with the net college, they don't have a strong engineering um, curriculum. It's mostly pre-engineering. Um, and so um, we've been uh, working with them in that way. And then with the community, the community aspect is all new, actually, um, with uh, our newest partnership with the net college. I'm sorry, uh, Dig Deep and with... Um, the Six World Solutions, we hope to do that more and to be able to train uh, the, the, the community members, particularly those on the ground doing um, action and change in their communities. So I think, it, I think it's all very new. We have um, been talking to Native Renewables, which you may be familiar with. It's a nonprofit um, installing solar panels. We've been really involved in the just transition um, and uh, we, the, 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 the founder of Native Renewables is now appointed in the Biden administration to um, lead the, the, the Department of um, Tribal Energy. Her name is Wahela Johns. But we're continuing to work with Dr. Suzanne Singer in talking about solar training along with um, uh, Professor Simmons Potter. Um, in our latest uh, version, because we're constantly reiter reiterating the design of these awkward technologies, is now going to household scale. And in that, uh, we do want to have um, enough power that could be used for um, lighttime, uh, nighttime lighting. And... Um, we, beyond that, we, we haven't really um, assessed 
the other solar needs, uh, energy needs, I'm sorry. Um, but it has become up a real issue. Um, the Star School contacted us because a lot of the kids didn't have um, a way to power their computer um, and even to power um, what they need to go to school. So um, it's a real challenge for, for uh, distant learning as well. Great, thank you. Hi, Carletta, this is Kirsten Engel. Thank you so much for this talk this morning. I was just wondering if you could say anything about, you know, are, is, is there any silver lining um, to what um, the tribal nations have gone through in Arizona with COVID? I mean, things that we can take away, ways in which maybe despite the just enormous cost, it's, it's just been so horrible, but, um, are there things that have been established during this, you know, crisis that we can, you know, learn from uh, that have actually pushed uh, issues ahead on the environment or, or health? Um, I think that the Navajo Nation Water Access Coordination Group is definitely uh, an example of an, a success story. Um, although the Navajo Nation's uh, care funds were quite delayed, the Indian Health Service um, were able to get their funds more quickly. And so um, through the Navajo Nation working with IHS to spend the IHS um, Navajo care dollars, they were able to install over 50 new transitional watering points. Mm -hmm. And as part of that engineering and design, imagine getting the funds like in you know, April and you got to spend it by December um, this quickly uh, created conversations, um, brought together a collaborative uh, group of uh, nonprofits, universities, federal and state entities to basically bring everything they had to the table to try to help the Navajo Nation and IHS um, do this uh, construction very quickly. And it was um, really, really um, an honor to be part of that and to bring together uh, the collaborators that we had who already have been working with the Navajo Nation for many years to so basically put all our data together to try to um, provide water quality data to um, help their decision-making process. And then in addition, I think um, it has brought people together quickly um, having, you know, being in this remote time, um, being on Zoom. I know we all hate Zoom, but, <laughs> but it actually really um, brought down a lot of barriers um, and getting access to people more quickly and to apply for grants more quickly, share data, um, just communication. And, and then even with the Navajo Nation, although it was very challenging, it's still very, it is still very challenging. It also has helped with um, building those partnerships. So I think, um, I think that is a success. And I believe that into the future, there are more tools being developed to, for emergency response. Um, you know, with the Gold Key Mines Build the Navajo Nation's emergency response was actually helped for this pandemic because initially, even with the Amber Alert, it was very hard. Um, you know, there was a young child that was kidnapped and killed um, during the same time as the Gold Key Mine Spill emergency. So emergency and pre preparedness has been at the forefront of the mind of the Navajo leaders. So they created a um, better Amber Alert, which they actually now use with the, goal, with the um, pandemic. So I get alerts on my phone um, about curfews, about infection rates, about um, vaccinations. Um, so that's all coming back from the Gold Key Mine spill, um, the loss of that young girl, and now with the pandemic. So that's definitely a success story in that sense. Thank you, yeah. Hmm. Just jump in, I don't have all of you on one screen. So I do see Tony. 
I just want to say for this group, what an extraordinary leader Dr. Chief is. Now, our outreach would not have been feasible uh, in the powerful way that it was if it weren't for her prior work, her respect on Navajo is extraordinary. And the first call that we had with the, the, the really talented water team from UA uh, with the leadership, she, she was the first speaker and spoke to the leaders in Navajo first, followed by English. And at every point, her guidance with respect to what it means for a respectful tribal cons consultation to occur has been, um, I, I really can't imagine um, the same process without her. So if the, uh, the silver lining um, uh, would itself wouldn't have been possible without Dr. Chief. And uh, if I can put in a plug, um, as we say, we want we can't clone her. If we could, we would. What we need to do is to build a stronger pipeline here at Arizona, um, building on the existing strengths of people who have the traditional knowledge and, and can enable us to do our work at that high level. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chief. Talk about an honor. Um, uh, watching you work is really something else. Oh, that's so kind of you, Tony. And I would just respond by saying um, what Ron and I are always advocating is to hire more Native faculty, because I can um, assure you that many of our Native faculty are doing the same type of uh, leadership in their own respective fields. And um, more is needed in STEM. And uh, other universities are doing these types of um, targeted uh, recruitment and hires of indigenous faculty. So I think U of A um, needs to do more and I'm just hoping that will happen someday. Dr. Okay. Chief, I'd love, I loved uh, hearing about the training opportunities that are available to the graduate students and uh, I'm just wondering if there are opportunities that we could involve the law students in and, and maybe even bring in our clinics uh, to, to help with our, your effort. Yes, that is a very good question. Um, we haven't done that uh, in terms of involving the law, um, law students, although um, Professor Hopkins did present at our Native Voices in STEM and um, we talked about, it, especially he does work in the environment with indigenous uh, communities. But we haven't actually really taken it even further um, or even do, done anything actually on that. Um, so there's all, always room for that discussion and um, definitely would love to have more faculty take that on and explore how, that, how we can do that. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I have three questions that are really short. Uh, that's, that's okay. You can ask them, Carol. Okay. Um, uh, but first, I'd like to say thank you so much to uh, our chief for what you've been doing. This is a just tremendous effort. And, and I'm sure that Tony is absolutely right that much of the success depends on you. And so thank you. Uh, the questions I had, I, I think they're just yes or no mostly. One was, I didn't quite understand about the water purification system. Does that purify the water of the arsenic and uranium um, uh, elements too? It, it, uh, so that was the first question. The second question was that I was also uncertain about the points that you were making about the uh, people who are English speaking only. Uh, and I didn't understand whether they were more susceptible to COVID, perhaps because they were distant from the community or less susceptible because um, uh, Navajo only speakers might be in remote areas and hard to reach. So that was my second question. And the third was whether the Johnson & Johnson uh, uh, COVID protection might have some further um, um, uh, implications for the Navajo community just because it's uh, it's a one vaccine shot and it can be um, uh, it doesn't need the special storage and and mm -hmm. it's just easier to handle. So those are the those are the questions that I have. Yes, um, the first question, yes the water uh, treatment units do remove uh, arsenic and uranium and that is the goal to provide uh, clean drinking water off-grid for people that are 
resorting to non-potable sources. Um, I mean, they're already using, you know, non-potable, non-drinking water. And so having this uh, system either in their communities or in their homes, we, we currently just um, mm -hmm. designed a household unit that would just really um, provide uh, clean drinking water more um, easily. And then the second question, yes, I'm so sorry I didn't communicate that well. Um, it's probably just me. No, <laughs> so. no, I think it's me. <laughs> so yes, um, looking at you know the publicly available data and the um, the, the the census data, um, even with just you know such a, 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 a crude um, uh, uh, spatially representation, you know of those big eight blocks. We still were able to find that language was a risk factor for COVID-19 infection, meaning that those that spoke Navajo only okay. got COVID-19 more. And that just means that language is so important to communicating right. what COVID-19 is. Okay. And even the translation of COVID-19 was not accurately communicated a lot of controversy around just that translation. So being able to have public health messaging that um, is reaching, you know, the elders and those that only speak Navajo is really important to protecting their health. Um, so currently for the third question, only Pfizer and Moderna are um, approved for use on the Navajo Nation. I'm not too familiar with how that approval process works. But um, I don't know if they'll uh, use Johnson & Johnson right now. But um, it seems to me like right now, the challenge is getting the young people vaccinated because many of the uh, hospitals are vaccinated 16 and 18 and older. Um, maybe not so much the teenagers, but kind of like you know the 20 to 30 range, um, making sure they get vaccinated because um, they were actually the ones that were more higher um, incidences of infection. And there was talk about how they were bringing the virus home to the elders because mm -hmm. these were multi-generational households. So now I think it's getting them vaccinated more than availability of vaccines. Okay. Thank you. I, th I think uh, this is all the, the time we have for today, but... Uh... Uh, Carletta, wonderful job. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate what you've been doing and wish you the very best. And of course, anything I can do, let me know. So thank you. Thank you thank so you much. So All right.